Good day students and welcome to the session where we will um, look at chapter 3 which is the entrepreneurial process. So in the chapter we will look specifically at certain outcomes and these outcomes will look at understanding the economic effects of entrepreneurial activity. Uh, we'll look at the personal characteristics uh, of the entrepreneur and how it influences um, one's performance and then we'll also look at um, entrepreneurial venture uh, in relation to small uh, business but we'll look specifically at the role of the um, entrepreneur in relation to the small business manager um, we'll also look at um, how businesses well, sorry how entrepreneurs can go about uh, exploiting new business opportunities and then we'll look at the entrepreneurial process and how it works and then we we'll also lastly we'll look at uh, general dynamics of business growth. So the framework of the chapter looks specifically at the concept of entrepreneurship, the characteristics of the entrepreneur and its motivation, uh, the roots to entrepreneurship, the process involved, the mindset involved, and also growing uh, the business. So when you think of an entrepreneur, you think of someone who's uh, decided on entering a business uh, venture, uh, but that individual would need to identify a, an opportunity in the market uh, and this also involve, um, entails rather the individual uh, gathering resource whether being capital or human resources and creating um, and growing a business venture that would satisfy the target audience's needs. So the entrepreneur then will take the risk of the venture and is rewarded with profit uh, if it succeeds. So we know about this basic uh, underlying definition of what an entrepreneur uh, is all about. Um, and from that, on, that definition itself, there are certain aspects that we look at. We look at the fact that the entrepreneur identifies an opportunity, is innovative and creative, uh, gathers resources, contributes towards uh, creating and growing the business, takes risks, being rewarded for taking those risks. Uh, and lastly, managing the business. So these are some of the aspects that uh, you should know uh, more or less about. Um, this is just expounding more about the characteristics about the entrepreneurs, but some of it we will get some of it you should know already about. Um, the entrepreneur is committed, is determined, is opportunity driven, um, has a tolerance for risk, ambiguity, and uncertainty. And if you look at the uh, South African economic context, there is a great level of uncertainty, uh, particularly with regards to the um, economic climate, and here we look specifically at the role of government um, and many other aspects as well. So an entrepreneur needs to be able to um, address um, risk through uncertainty and also ambiguity. We know that an entrepreneur is creative and innovative, we looked at it in the previous uh, definition. Uh, but also what is quite important with the entrepreneur is that he or she enjoys a locus of control so there's a greater sense of autonomy and freedom uh, to do as he or she pleases. Um, the entrepreneur is also self-reliant but what is also quite important is that the entrepreneur has the ability to adapt and that's where the whole idea of uncertainty comes into play with regards to the economic context. The Last characteristic looks at the fact that the entrepreneur is also motivated and there are underlying factors as well. So if you look at the various types of entrepreneur, for instance, you, um, if you compare a, um, an entrepreneur who is concerned about identifying an opportunity in the market, then the entrepreneur is seen as someone who is uh, innovative. But then we also have what is known as survivalist entrepreneurs and they are individuals who start businesses primarily with the idea of um, ensuring that they are able to provide for their families. So there are different motivational factors in terms of why people actually start businesses um, as entrepreneurs. Now there are certain routes to entrepreneurship. Now if you look at uh, the first one starting a new business venture. Uh, we'll look at that uh, aspect a little bit more in detail in the next few slides. 
but other routes entail buying an existing business, buying a franchise, or entering a family business. So these are some of the aspects that they should have been exposed to probably in business management too. So I won't discuss some of these uh, in detail. Now, if you're looking at um, buying an existing business, there are certain steps. And the first step looks at the uh, ability of the entrepreneur to conduct a search for businesses that are for sale. Now, there are numerous websites available, um, websites such as bizforsale.co.za or bizexchange.co.za. And there are websites that provide um, prospective investors or buyers or entrepreneurs in inv investing in existing businesses. Uh, obviously, there will be financial implications with um, investing in um, such businesses, particularly depending on the size of the, the business itself and the industry involved. Um, when conducting a search for business, one could also work through a broker uh, as one uh, example. In the second step, this entails that the entrepreneur now needs to investigate and evaluate the available businesses uh, out of the pool um, of businesses from step one. And this will entail that the entrepreneur now looks at the uh, profitability of the uh, available business. Um, and this would entail the individual looking at the income statements for the last five years. And here we look specifically at audited uh, financial statements because if you're looking at audited statements, it shows that there's a level of transparency and credibility associated um, with the income statements itself. Um, when the entrepreneur evaluates the business, he or she also looks at the uh, infrastructure and the, the various location factors, which you, are, you, should, which you should probably know about um, as well. Um, but also what is quite important to understand uh, from the entrepreneur's perspective uh, is to explore, for instance, why the business is for sale. So these are the first two steps. And then once the entrepreneur has um, investigate and evaluate the available business, he or she will then make a decision with regards to valuing um, the existing business. And there are various valuation uh, methods. There's the asset-based approach, which essentially entails um, an asset-based uh, business valuation. And this will include totaling up uh, all the investments in the company. Then we have the income appropriation approach, and this is considered as an earning value approach, um, and it's based on the idea that a business's value lies in its ability to produce wealth in the future. So here we're looking specifically at the entrepreneur's um, uh, evaluation of uh, previous income statements, and using these income statements to project uh, whether the business will actually be profitable uh, in the near future. Then also we look at what is known as the market value approach. And the market value approach um, is an attempt to establish the value of the specific business by comparing um, the business to similar ones that have recently been sold. So uh, it relates a lot to, for instance, the property market when you are um, investing in um, property, then uh, what, would quite, what would be quite important to look at is the, the price or the, rather the price of houses that have been sold in the area, a specific area um, in, that, yeah, in that context. Okay, so that's step three. And then step four would entail uh, negotiating a price um, and the terms of the purchase agreement. So uh, the purchase agreement is a legal document and it is signed by both the buyer and the seller. Uh, and once it is signed by both parties, it is legally a binding contract. So if the buyer has signed the purchase agreement, they cannot uh, pull out of this um, agreement. Um, something I didn't mention to you earlier on 
with regards to the valuation of the business is that um, there's no set step that an entrepreneur actually follows. For instance, uh, as an entrepreneur, um, it does not mean that if one is following, for instance, a market value approach that one ignores, for instance, the income um, appropriation, asset-based approaches. So the best valuation methods look specifically at combining um, some of these methods, uh, two or three of these methods, and then hiring a business valuator as a means of advising the entrepreneur on the best methods uh, or method used to determine the price of uh, the business. Okay, so those are the four steps um, when buying an existing business. Now, the entrepreneurial process um, entails uh, the following, identifying and evaluating an opportunity. So there needs to be a gap uh, in the market. Uh, if you're starting uh, a business, and for instance, you haven't necessarily considered uh, the opportunity in the market, then it, me it would mean that competitors uh, could easily uh, identify that opportunity, that window of opportunity, and provide the particular product or service on the market. So once your entrepreneur has um, identified and evaluated the opportunity, that would lead the entrepreneur in developing a business plan uh, and nowadays, if you intend on starting a business and, uh, for instance, you want to start um, a clothing store in a, in a mall, then it's important for you to uh, de develop a business plan and present a business plan uh, to prospective uh, investors or the organization in which you would be um, uh, renting the specific uh, premises and it's quite interesting the way um, for instance malls operate uh, where you pay uh, per square meter uh, a particular amount so for instance if it's um, if it's uh, uh, let's say a 10 square meter uh, property and is valued at let's say uh, 30 rand per square meter, uh, then it would mean that it would cost, for instance, uh, 300 rand. That's just a basic uh, example. Okay, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so there's a different, there's a specific website that you can also um, look at um, uh, that would assist you in, uh, rather the third party company could assist you with developing a business plan and the website is called uh, Swift Reg so it's S W I F T R E G um, and if you search for it on the internet you will be able to come to this website and the website uh, provides um, prospective entrepreneurs with uh, particular services and one of the services entails developing a business plan and a business plan can be quite a timely and uh, um, exercise. So perhaps it would be important for you to uh, acquire the necessary expertise. Okay, and then the third step entails, or the third process entails determining the resources required. And this does not necessarily mean that we're looking at human uh, resources. It also entails capital or uh, financial resources. The last aspect looks at starting and managing the enterprise and here it's specifically at um, the underlying functions of uh, general manager, uh, planning, organizing, leading and controlling um, and that relates a lot to the managerial aspect uh, of the enterprise. Okay, so that's the entrepreneurial process. If you're looking at um, the entrepreneurial mindset, uh, here we are looking specifically at comparing um, a small business owner to that of an entrepreneur. Now, if you're looking at an entrepreneur, 
entrepreneurs, they dream big, they think big, uh, they come up with innovative and creative ideas that haven't even been on the market or tested. Um, and a lot of times, entrepreneurs, these entrepreneurs uh, don't even know if the ideas are possible, but that to a large extent also excites them. So the entrepreneur is quite innovative, but if you're looking at the small business owner, a small business owner is primarily concerned with solving a particular problem in the community or providing a service or product uh, to the local community. Um, and they know their business, they know their target audience, and they're more concerned about ensuring that the customers are always happy. So um, a small business a venture would not necessarily be innovative, uh, but in the context of um, uh, serving the targeted audience, the small business owner is primarily concerned about um, ensuring that the targeted audience's needs uh, have been attended to. Now, if you're looking at the potential for growth aspect, uh, entrepreneurs, as I mentioned, they love risks. Um, and they will, are always willing to uh, create new products by by um, entering new business, sorry, entering new uh, markets, and there's a risk in entailed with regards to that, okay? But the entrepreneur sees potential for growth in particular markets, whereas the small business owner is more concerned about ensuring that um, decisions are calculated, uh, outcomes are clear, uh, there's no ambiguity or uncertainty, there's a greater level of consistency uh, in that regard. So the potential for growth to a large extent distinguishes the entrepreneur from the small business owner and this also impacts on the strategic objectives. Remember that the uh, small business owner is more concerned about ensuring sustainability of the business. The entrepreneur is more concerned in that regard with innovation and creativity and coming up with new products and services. So therefore the strategic objectives to a large extent uh, would differ from the small business owner in that regard. Okay, now there are certain stages of growth that every business uh, goes through. And the first step entails incubation. And this is the very beginning of the business life cycle. So before the entrepreneur even starts the business, um, the entrepreneur um, engages with um, many individuals, family and friends um, to make a decision with regards to entering a business. So one could consider this particular phase as the soul-searching phase um, with regards to determining uh, whether this is actually for the entrepreneur um, and making a decision with regards to feasibility and viability of the business. So that's the incubation phase. Then we also have what is known as the startup and infancy phase. So this phase looks at the fact that um, once the entrepreneur has canvassed and tested this uh, specific business idea uh, and is satisfied with it ready to go to the market, then uh, the entrepreneur will make the decision about launching and starting up the business. Uh, now many believe that this startup stage is quite a risky stage because there are a lot of uh, financial aspects uh, involved. I mean, if you're looking at an entrepreneur, it would, when you're starting a business, it would take a considerable a considerable amount of financial resource and human resources uh, to start up uh, this particular business. So adaptability is therefore key, and much of the time in this stage, uh, the entrepreneur is concerned about tweaking products and services uh, based on initial feedback from consumers. Then we have what is known as the breakthrough stage. And the breakthrough stage looks at the fact that the business is now generating a consistent source of income and regularly takes on new customers. So the cash flow in this stage starts to improve. 
um, as recurring revenues help to uncover, sorry, cover ongoing expenses. So the entrepreneur is looking specifically at ensuring that the business is profitable um, in this regard. Obviously, profits will be slow and steady, um, but the business is starting to grow um, in this, during this particular stage. Then we have what is known as the maturity stage. And at this stage, the entrepreneur might feel that there's almost a routine feel like uh, um, culture with regards to running the business. Um, and staff, for instance, in this place, handle that the areas that uh, the entrepreneur no longer has to manage uh, because the firm is now established uh, in its presence within a particular industry. And therefore, the entrepreneur looks for specifically at identifying other industries or other markets to enter. Um, and it's seen as um, a means of ensuring that the business does not remain stagnant, but uh, grows. So there's a lot of risk taking uh, here involved here as well during this stage. And then we have the final stage, which is referred to as the decline or rejuvenation stage. So we will recall in the pre maturity stage, the entrepreneur um, wavered the idea of entering a new market. Um, that would also depend on the profitability of the business. So having navigated during the expansion stage of the business um, life cycle successfully, uh, the business should then uh, consider exploring other opportunities. And while other companies grow during this particular phase, um, it does not mean that the business will necessarily um, generate more profits by entering a new market. And that's why I see there's a lot of risk taking uh, involved. So there are certain questions that the entrepreneur needs to ask him or herself. Um, are the opportunities involved in this expansion? Uh, will it generate enough um, money? Is it feasible? Is it viable? Um, so those are some of the aspects that the entrepreneur needs to look at. Um, and based on the entrepreneur's decision about entering a market, it would either lead to um, a rejuvenation of a new product or service, or it could also, also lead to decline. Um, for instance, if the entrepreneur remains stagnant, <clears throat> then it would mean that competitors um, are entering the market and are not providing the same service which would ultimately impact on the profitability of the entrepreneur's business. Okay, so those are the stages of growth of a business and this is more or less the diagram that we look at, the incubation, the infancy, the breakthrough, the maturity and the decline or rejuvenation um, stages. We spoke about the resources uh, in the growing firm. Yeah, we're looking specifically at the capital and also human resources, and this will Im actually Im ultimately impact on the profit. But depending on whether the entrepreneur is more concerned about sustainability or uh, greater risk taking, and we know that entrepreneur takes risks, that could either lead the entrepreneur in investing further uh, in more assets, um, whether fixed current with other investments or more human resources um, in that regard. Okay, so those are the resources in the growing firm. And then we also have certain growing uh, growth strategies that the entrepreneur could also um, consider. The generic growth strategy looks specifically at partnerships, acquisitions, mergers, um, and franchises, franchising. Um, and depending on which um, growth strategy would be most worthwhile, uh, there are a number of factors that would need to be taken into consideration. Um, but we will be looking at some of these aspects um, in one of the other chapters, such as international management and globalization. So we will look at some of these um, aspects a little bit more in detail. but you should also ensure that you understand, um, for instance, what a, uh, a joint venture is, for instance, or an acquisition or a merger, 
uh, what franchising is all about. Okay, so that's just more or less what the generic growth uh, strategy is about. And then we have what is known as um, a vertical integration. And then we also have what is known as horizontal and lateral uh, integration. So vertical integration is this strategy in which a business or company uh, takes complete control over one or more stages in the production or distribution of a product. So if a company initially had a third party company uh, producing, for instance, a particular um, input for a, a product, then the company would take over by providing that specific uh, product. For instance, if you're looking at um, uh, Apple, for instance, uh, the Apple iPhone used to use the Samsung uh, CPU device, um, but then Apple decided, okay, we will create our own CPU devices, and therefore there was no need for uh, Samsung to provide um, the CPU device. So that's an example more or less of what uh, vertical uh, integration uh, is all about. And within vertical integration, we also have what is known as backward and forward integration. Now, if you're looking at backward in integration, an example would be, for instance, a car manufacturer may acquire the tire and electrical component factories. Um, but if you're looking at forward in integration, then you're looking at the after-sales services that are provided by the company. So for instance, uh, instead of the company having a third-party organization uh, to uh, promote or provide any after-sales uh, services for the vehicles, what they would do is they would take over from that company. So vertical integration would also entail what is known as backward integration and forward integration. Then we have what is known as horizontal integration. And here we look specifically at the acquisition of business activities that are at the same level of the value chain in similar or different industries. So, for example, um, uh, one company, for example, um, purchases um, other competing uh, companies that are provide a specific service, then uh, it would look at, we would consider it as horizontal integration. If you're looking at um, Lateral integration, then lateral integration entails the merging of two firms who sell uh, related goods or services, um, but they do, not com they do not compete directly with one another. So as with horizontal integration, uh, we're looking at companies that are competing with one another. They're providing uh, similar services, similar products, and therefore companies would take over uh, those companies to ensure that they control and dominate the market. Whereas with lateral integration, um, we have one company taking over another company that provides a completely uh, different service. So those are more or less the, the differences uh, between it. Another example, for instance, with horizontal integration uh, could be, for instance, where you have, um, let's say, MTN taking over Vodacom and taking over Salsi and providing... Uh, cellular services to uh, consumers. Lateral integration could be, for instance, um, on, and this actually has happened, uh, Tetley, who prov uh, Tetley, yeah, they provided uh, tea. They, for instance, um, was it Tata, Tata, sorry, Tata also provided tea, and they, uh, they've also entered the car industry. So it's a completely uh, different kind of industry. Another example would be, for instance, Nokia, uh, who initially produced the rubber and then entered the market to provide uh, cellular phones, cell phones during that time. Okay, so that's lateral integration, we've horizontal integration. 
and vertical integration just remember there's backward and there's forward integration so um, there are certain services within the company the company wants to ensure that they uh, there's a lot of this uh, uniformity in terms of the services and products provided or the services provided so the company will try to ensure that there's backward integration but there's also forward integration where the company ensure that they also provide the services instead of um, having a third co third party company do that okay so those are the growth strategies um, that we looked at and then we also have the methods to achieve growth and I want you to read over what joint ventures are what acquisitions are what mergers are and what franchising is all about you should know more or less about it but I don't want to spend too much time on that I want you to read also up on that okay so um, what you need to do is to ensure that you've now understood the chapter once you've gone through the slides um, please go through the questions at the end of the chapter um, and then go over the case studies um, and then you should be able to um, understand this chapter for a future test uh, or examination okay so that's the end of the lesson and I will create another lesson for uh, the next chapter goodbye